Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram Hare 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 Namaste, Saraswati Deve, Gorvani Pacharine, Nivrise Sasunyavadi, Pastyatyade Satarine, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu, Nityananda, Advaita Gadadhar, Shiva Sari Gor, Bhakta Vrind, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai So today is the disappearance day of the one of the greatest acharyas in the history of Vaishnav acharyas and Sri Ramanuja Acharya So we'll uh, speak a little bit about his life and narrate a couple very significant stories which I think will be uh, very uh, helpful in us understanding some of the details of devotional service. Just to give you a general description, Ramanujacharya is the foremost of all the Acharyas of the Sri Sampradaya and um, he lived practically back in the, yeah, the 1100s. 1100s, about 1,000 years ago. In fact, the year 2019 was his uh, 1,000th anniversary, I think, yeah, 2019. So it's about 1,002 years. Um, there are four, what we call authorized Sampradaya. Sampradaya means disciplic succession of acharyas that have the authorization to teach the principles of pure devotional service. We have Sri Sampradaya with Ramanuja Acharya. We have the Rudra Sampradaya with Vishnu Swami. We have the Madhva Acharya. We have the uh, yeah, Madhva Sampradaya with Madhva Acharya. And then, of course, we have the, um, which is, we are also part of the Madhva Sampradaya. We are, um, well, they are actually a part of the Brahma Gaudiya Madhva Sampradaya. And then we have the um, Chakshushana or the uh, Kumara Sampradaya. These are the four Sampradayas. And without following the sampradaya, one cannot practice devotional service. Outside of the sampradayas, there is no, no authorized performance of devotional service. So um, Ramanujacharya was taught 
many, many fundamental principles for the execution of pure devotional service. And one of the two of the things that he taught was um, the importance of Vaishnav Seva. Out of all of these sampradayas, they put a lot of emphasis on serving Vaishnavas as their primary activity. And of course, we also, and uh, Lord Chaitanya, who established his, his, who became part of the, uh, our sampradaya, or we are part of his sampradaya, you might say, he took two principles from each of the four sampradayas, and from the Sri sampradayas, he took service to the Vaishnavas, and the importance of bhakti over karma and gyan, yeah, the, how, or actually, spontaneous devotional service, yeah, Bhaganuga Bhakti. He taught that. Uh, Ramanujacharya was an, a, a disciple of one of the, the greatest of all acharyas called Jamuna Acharya. Prabhupada speaks a lot about him as once being a great king, giving it all up, and how he uh, was teaching many principles. When Ramanujacharya left his body, uh, uh, it was understood by all those who were his followers that the most prominent person to succeed him was Ramanujacharya. During the time of the disappearance of Jamunacharya, when he was there, his body was laying on a bed, and devotees were around him, and there was a uh, a eulogy to honor his disappearance. While that was going on, he, the body of Jamunacharya raised his hand. And when he raised his hand, he went like this, with three fingers up. And nobody could understand. First they were amazed, because he had already left the body, but he raised his arm. <laughs> this is Jamunacharya. And he put up three fingers. Uh, no one could understand what those three fingers meant, and therefore they were all confused, except one person, who was Ramanujacharya. And then he explained, yes, Guru Maharaj wants us to perform three services. And these are his desires, the unfulfilled desires. One is to ex travel extensively and spread the message of Lord uh, Lord Narayan. So when he did that, one of the fingers went down like this. And then the second one is to write a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, establishing Lord Vishnu as the supreme, defeating all Brahmavadi and Mayavadi philosophy. When he said the second one, there was one finger left. And then the third one, he said, yes, he wants us to uh, honor the father of Vyasadeva, who was Parasaramuni, by naming a disciple after him. <laughs> and then when he said that, the third finger disappeared. So that was the three desires of Jamunacharya, that Ramanujacharya, because when one is intimately connected with the spiritual master, one knows the, the inner desires of the spiritual master. So that was related in public. And then everyone could understand you. And Ramanujacharya was the person. So he went on a, uh, what we say, a traveling and preaching program to establish the Supreme Personality of Godhead as, as Lord Narayan and to defeat all Mayavadi and personal philosophy. At that time, in the continent of India, uh, Mayavad was very strong. The Mayavadis had footholds everywhere and were propagating their philosophy. But Ramanujacharya, mm -hmm. after studying very carefully the scriptures and becoming well-versed in presentation of the scriptures, was going around and he was debating many of the Mayavadis. And in those days when you debated someone who had an opposite philosophy, the etiquette was that if, you, if you're defeated, you become that person's follower. Mm -hmm. That was the etiquette. Otherwise, you don't go into a debate. 
unless you agree that once you are, the loser becomes the father of the winner. Because <laughs> obviously there's a superior philosophy there. So you accept that. So there was one debate from a famous Mayavadi philosopher named Yagyamurti. And Yagyamurti was really quite arrogant. Mayavadi, very strong. He used to carry around a whole cartload of books because in order to establish your principles, you have to quote from Shastra. If you can't quote Shastra, you can't debate. <laughs> Otherwise, just speaking is nice, but you have to back up what you say by authoritative scripture. So that's how debates were carried on in those days. And even today, in many places. Unfortunately, nowadays, when people debate someone, if they lose, they don't change. <laughs> That means you really don't have any, that means you don't really have a deep understanding of your own knowledge. You wear your knowledge simply as a personal preference. So knowledge has to be followed. <laughs> knowledge is a direction. So he challenged Ramanujacharya. So Ramanujacharya decided to say, well, actually, I'm defeated by you. <laughs> He said it, without fighting. And so then Yogyamurti said, well, if that's the case, then you much, must teach Mayavad philosophy then. Then Ramanujacharya refused to do that. So then there was a debate. And so they debated for 18 days. <laughs> and no one could win. And Ramanujacharya was becoming somewhat frustrated trying to defeat this Mayavadi. So he had a deity. His deity was named Devaraj. So he went before the deity and really prayed hard, my dear Lord, and please give me the power to defeat this Mayavadi. So the next day, <clears throat> Ramanuja, when he appeared for the debate, he was like a fulgen. He had a bright light all around him, and everyone can see it, even Yogyamurti. So Yogyamurti immediately surrendered without debating. <laughs> so he was defeated by his effulgence. And then he became his disciple. And then he renamed him, that same Yagyamurti was renamed Devaraj Muni. <laughs> he gave him the name of the deity. Because <laughs> actually it was the deity that did it. Uh, when uh, some Brahmins had approached Ramanuja for Diksha, he sent them to Devaraj Muni who out of, ref out of humility refused to debate them. But he was being tested by his the spiritual master. And so um, just to see if he had become humble. <laughs> because in the presence of your own spiritual master, you don't take the position of being more authoritative. So Ramanuja wanted to test him and see if he actually developed Vaishnava humility. Because that's the etiquette. Just like if you're standing there along with your spiritual master and you're, someone asks you a question and you know the answer, but if your spiritual master is there, then you don't speak because you defer to your spiritual master. If your spiritual master says to you, you speak it, then you can do that. But to be presumptuous and is outside of the etiquette and actually it's considered to be offensive. <laughs> So one doesn't present themselves as more knowledgeable than a person who is in a, what we say, a position of having more knowledge. So everyone defers to the, what we say, the more knowledgeable. And that's how the etiquette goes. Oh, welcome, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, there's so beautiful, many beautiful stories. There's the story of when Ramanujacharya was traveling, he came to one place <clears throat> where he had a very wealthy disciple named Bhartaraj, who was quite wealthy, merchant. And so um, he decided, well, I think I'll go to Bhartaraj's house tonight and take prasadam there. So he sent two of his brahmacharis to go to the house of Bhartaraj and notify Bhartaraj 
that um, your Guru Maharaj is coming tonight, so please make all preparations. So he, uh, the two brahmacharis went, they came to the house of Bharaj. Oh, my god brothers are here. So they came in and uh, immediately they spoke, they said, Guru Maharaj is coming tonight, so please make all arrangements. So Bharaj got all excited, immediately left, went around the house, ordering his servants to do this, this, and then making all arrangements. So, um, but he didn't attend to the brahmacharis at all. He just, when he, they came in, he welcomed them and that was it. Once he heard, then he went around making arrangements. So when the brahmacharis came back, Ramanujacharya said, well, did you speak to him? He said, yes. And, oh, he's very enthusiastic to have you, or you're, you're coming tonight. Yes, but how did he treat you? Mm. Well, Guru Maharaj, in his enthusiasm, he pretty much ignored us <laughs> completely. So, Bar so Ramanujacharya said, I'm not going. <laughs> not going. But I'll go to the house of and then this other disciple. His name was um, um, let's see. His wife's name was Lakshmi. And I can't remember his name, Srivas, Srinivas or something, and said, but he was so poor that every day he would go out begging, and whatever he would get from begging, that was what they would have at night for prasad. And his wife was so poor that she wouldn't even come out in public because she, she didn't even have enough clothes to properly dress herself in front of others. So the two brahmacharis, they went to the house of this poor disciple of Ramanujacharya. And they knocked on the door, and then Lakshmi, the, the wife, she looked out to see who was there. Oh, it's the, it's the disciples of my, my spiritual master. But then she was unable to come out. <clears throat> she said, oh, why have you come? Well, Guru Maharaj wants to come and take prasadam tonight at your house. Oh, she got excited, but then she thought, we don't have anything. How are we going to honor our spiritual master? We're so, we, don't, we have hardly enough food from day to day. So what could she say? She said, yes, fine. She wouldn't, didn't want to refuse the invitation, but then she was thinking after the brahmachari, and she welcomed them nicely. Although they, um, she didn't have much, she offered them a glass of water, and that was enough to welcome them according to the level that would, she could offer. And then um, she was thinking, hmm, how am I going to get it? food to honor our spiritual master? He's coming and we have nothing. It would be embarrassing. But then she remembered there was one grocer who sometimes she would go there when she would have a few, a little bit of money, and she would buy something. And Lakshmi was very beautiful. She, uh, she was very attractive and very chaste. So this grocer, grocer when, he, when she would come in, he would always propose to her in, in different ways. But she didn't, have, she didn't have any interest in him at all. She just ignored him. But now she was thinking, hmm, I have to do something to honor my spiritual master. So she went, she went to the grocer and she said, uh, yes, I know you're always interested in me, so now I agree. Oh, really? After all this time? Yes. But my spiritual master is coming and I need some boga to cook for him, so please. He said, fine, you can take whatever you want. And then she said, after, after everything is over, I will come and see you. So he was all excited. He said, yes, you can take flour, you can take rice, you can take ghee, you can take vegetables. So he was giving her everything. And she had everything she needed, and she cooked a wonderful feast. In the meantime, her husband returned home. 
And then she told him the whole story. And then he was shocked. Now, where did you get all this polka from? Guru Maharaj is coming tonight. And I, you remember that grocer I always tell you about? He's always after me. And then she was embarrassed. She said, I had to offer myself to him in other words, to get this for Guru Maharaj. And he was very pleased. He said, oh, you are, you are so wonderful. Yes, to please spiritual master, we will, do, we will do whatever is required. So, and now a beautiful feast was cooked and then Ramanuja Acharya arrived. <coughs> and then he was quite amazed to see what she had prepared. It was in a nice, nice feast, nicely prepared with the finest ingredients. And so he took the feast and as he was taking the feast, he could understand what happened. And then he said to her, I can see there's some concern here. So please tell me, what is it? And then she was embarrassed. She said, I had to, in order to get this to do, in order to serve you, Guru Maharaj, I have to give up my chastity. Ramanujacharya thought. And then he left remnants. So he said, to, uh, he said to the husband, you see these remnants, you pack them up and you give them to your wife. And when she goes to that grocer tonight, bring my remnants to him. So they did, made a nice package. And of course, Ramanujachari was so happy, and blessed the family, and then after some time, he left. So now it was time for her to fulfill her promise to the grocer. So with the remnants of her Guru Maharaj, she came. And then she came and the grocer was so excited. Oh, she's coming. <coughs> and so when she came, she said, yes, thank you for helping to me, for me to serve my Guru Maharaj. I'm so indebted to you. But my spiritual master, he also wants to um, give you some mercy. So here, these are some of the things I cooked for him, which are now his remnants. So please take. So he sat down to take the remnants. And as he was eating the remnants, he started to cry. <laughs> his heart was completely changed. He said, and then he was feeling so embarrassed and so bad that he had been chasing after her. And he said, oh, you are a saint. You are like my mother. Please, I cannot take advantage of your, your, you know, your kindness. You are just, you are my, you are worshipable by me. He was glorifying her in all ways. So in that way, she saved her chastity by the grace of the spiritual master. He saved her by the power of his remnants. <laughs> just by taking his remnants, that person's heart was completely changed. So that's the power of what we call Maha Maha. <laughs> it's not just Maha, it's Maha Maha. And then, um, that rich merchant who Ramanujacharya never went to, that house that night, he was wondering, he made, he cooked a huge feast and everything. Oh, he fixed the house up so nice. But he didn't, Maharaj didn't come, Ramanuj. So then he was wondering, what happened? I must have committed some offense. So after some time, he sent some of his servants to find Ramanujacharya. And Ramanujacharya actually came the next day and said, the reason I didn't come is because you know, you think you are serving me, but you're not serving those who serve me. Therefore, you're not serving me. <laughs> so to serve the spiritual master also means to serve his devotees. One, that is called, there's a neophyte stage of bhakti, where one likes to worship the Lord and the guru, but doesn't have, doesn't have very good relationships with the other devotees. That is called neophyte or prakrita bhakta. Uh, that bhakta that is not is called materialistic devotee. 
He doesn't see the value of preaching to the conditioned souls, nor does he see the value of developing loving relationships with other Vaishnavas. So Ramanujacharya, especially in his Sampradaya, they teach that very, very important. The importance of Vaishnav Seva is the highest principle of their teachings. And they're in there. I spent two times, I went to their, in, to Sri Rangam with Radha Swami Maharaj and many of disciples. We went there for yatras in the year 2005 and the year again 2010. And especially in the year 2005, we had we were received like we were, like, you know, like coming from Vaikuntha, <laughs> the way they treated us. They gave us gifts. They honored us so many ways. They made all the facilities that we needed in order for us for us to feel comfortable. Now they were very personal, uh, even though they didn't know any of us. They still they they treated us very very respectively and warmly. So I never forgot that. Um, that's one of the beautiful teachings of uh, Ramanujacharya. There are two other ones. One, Ramanujacharya also had two other spiritual masters that were her, more like his shiksha gurus, and that was Mahapura, Mahapurna and Gostipurna. And uh, Ghosty Purna was living a distance away from where Ramanuja was. Ghosty Purna was a very powerful acharya. Uh, actually, Mahapurna actually told Ramanuja Acharya, if you want to learn further more of the teachings of Vaishnav Siddhanta, you have to go to Ghosty Purna. Because Ghosty Purna has a special mantra. And he doesn't give out that mantra to everyone. But you go and you ask him for that mantra. So in order to go to where Ghosti Purna, Ramanujacharya had to travel like hundreds of miles. So he went and Ghosti Purna said, no, I can't give you the mantra. Mm -hmm. So he came back and after some time he, he went again. So he went 17 times. <laughs> Each time, you know, there's no Rajdani Express. So you get on the train and uh, <laughs> you have to go by, either by cart, bullock cart, or you have to walk. So it was an arduous journey to go to see the spiritual teacher. And finally, he was determined, so he went the 18th time. And Ghosty Purna said, all right, I can see you are worthy. He was testing him. <laughs> so one of the principles that remains foremost in becoming a disciple is to be tested by the spiritual master. If you, one has to undergo the test of the spiritual master to see if one is worthy to become the disciple. So many times the spiritual master will give tests. I remember one house I was staying in, this was in London. I was living with a very nice family. And the, the lady of the house, she told me that her spiritual master tested her. She was unmarried, and when she first met her spiritual master, and he told her, you have to live in the Brahmachari ashram, Brahmacharini ashram for one year before I can accept you for initiation. She wasn't at all inclined to that. But because she understood it was the instruction, she did it. And she said, after I did it, and during when I did it, I could understand the importance of following that instruction. So don't feel uh, unhappy if you get tested. <laughs> That's part of growing in spiritual life. Without tests, you don't grow. Just like when you go to school, you learn the subject matter, and then at the end of the session, you get a test to see if you actually know it. <laughs> so in the same way, we have to pass the tests of the spiritual master. And if we're, if we're eager for that, then by the mercy of the spiritual master, it becomes easy. If not, we're not eager, then that's the problem. <laughs> okay, so finally, 
But then Gosti Pona said, I will give you this mantra, but you have to understand one thing. It's a secret mantra. You don't tell anyone this mantra. This mantra is so powerful that anyone who chants it immediately attains liberation. And it's a secret mantra. So Ramanujachari agreed, and Ghosti Pona gave him the mantra, which was an eight syllable mantra. Yeah, four syllable mantra. Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. That's the mantra. Anyone who chants this will become liberated. It's secret. You don't give it out. It's just I'm giving it to you because I can see you are worthy. So he was happy, received the mantra. And that day, the same day, Ramanujacharya went into the town and called all the townspeople together. And he said, tonight at 7 o'clock, meet me by the temple. I have a special mantra to give all of you. <laughs> so he called all the townspeople. So everybody came, and he stood, and he chanted the mantra and told everyone, chant this mantra, and you will receive liberation. Disobey the orders of his spiritual master. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because he felt, well, I don't want to be liberated alone. I want to liberate everyone. <laughs> so here's the way. So, but then when the word got back to uh, Ghosty Porno, oh, he was fried. <laughs> he was so angry. He couldn't even speak. <laughs> he was just so angry. And Ramanujacharya came and fell at his feet, and he was saying, I instructed you and you agreed not to tell this mantra. Why did you do it? And he was chastising him and so and said, therefore, I'm going to curse you to go to hell. <laughs> Whoa. So Ramanujacharya with folded hands, he said, Guru Maharaj, if, if liberating all these people is for me to go to hell, I'm happy to go to hell. <laughs> In other words, he was thinking, they're all getting the benefit, I don't mind, <laughs> whatever happens to me. And then when Ghosty Purna heard that, and it was sincerely given, it wasn't just like he was just saying that, he said, he changed. He said, you know, you are my guru, and I'm your, I'm your disciple. <laughs> So he offered his obeisances and fell at the feet of Ramanujacharya. <laughs> he completely changed when he saw the compassion of the heart of Ramanujacharya that he was willing to suffer just to give others the mercy. So then, of course, uh, when we were traveling, we also went to the place where Ramanujacharya stood in the temple and gave that mantra. <laughs> and the house of Ghosty Purna is right near that same area. I can't remember. It's somewhere in, of course, in South India. So yeah, that was a nice experience. And I'll tell one other very interesting story. The life of Ramanujachari is so amazing. His devotion. And what he inspired in his followers, especially there was one follower whose name was Koresh. Koresh was, this is a beautiful story that really takes quite long. There was one king called Kolatunga. Kolatunga was a follower of Lord Shiva. And he was a very vicious king. And he wanted to convert everyone to be worshipers of Lord Shiva. So he knew about Ramanujacharya, who was preaching to worship Lord Narayan. And so one of his, one of his associates, his minister, had been a disciple of Ramanujacharya and left Ramanujacharya and joined Kolatanga. You know, in other words, he blooped. 
And so he kept pushing the king, you know, that you're not going to be able to spread the glories of Lord Shiva unless you destroy Ramanujacharya. He was envious and wanted to get back at Ramanujacharya. So Kolatanga said, all right, what should we do? So we should call a debate here, and we will defeat him. And then when, once he's defeated, then and if we don't defeat him, we'll kill him. The king thought it was a good idea. <laughs> so they sent the word out. And the word came to Ramanujachari. And Koresh was there at the time. Now, Koresh was a brahmachari. And so um, when they heard that this king had invited Ramanujachari for a debate, uh, Koresh could understand the intention of the king. So what he did, he said, Guru Maharaj, give me your clothes. I'll go on your behalf. So Koresh went on, be on, on behalf because the king couldn't remember or didn't remember what Brahmanujacharya looked like. And wearing the, gar the same garb, because Koresh was similar, even the minister couldn't tell the difference because it had been many years since then. So he came along with Mahapurna. They both came. Mahapurna was quite old. Now, many, many, many years ago, that same king had a small daughter who was haunted by a ghost. And Ramanujacharya came and exorcised that ghost out of that girl. So the king received a favor from Ramanujacharya many years ago. So now, when Ramanujacharya came, but he didn't come, Koresh came as Ramanujacharya, they set up these you know, persons to debate. And Koresh, he was expert in the philosophy and in, and in the art of debating, he defeated them. So now, the king said, all right, since you've been defeated, well, you, you defeated us, well, we're going to kill you. <laughs> but then, uh, the king remembered, well, actually, he did save my uh, daughter. So rather than king kill them, they, they took some guards and brought them out into a forest and blinded both Koresh and Mahapurna. And they left them in the forest to die. They blinded both of them. Now, Ram, now, of course, being blinded, they couldn't see which way to go. So finally, Mahapurna decided, well, you go. You try to get back to Ramanujacharya. I'm going to stay here. I'm old. So Mahapurna left his body on his own volition. And somehow, by the grace of some brahmanas and, his wa and their wives, they got ba uh, Raman, uh, Koresh got back to... And then, of course, when Ramanujachari heard the whole story, he was really you know, grateful that his, you know, his disciple had saved his life. <coughs> and so... And so one day, after so many years, the Ramanujacharya said to Koresh, Koresh, you know, go to Bhartaraj, because Ramanujacharya was worshipping the deity of Bhartaraj. You can still go and see that deity today. And uh, ask him to give you your eyes back. So... Koresh went, sat in front of Bhartaraj, and didn't say anything. And then the deity spoke to him. You've come? Yes. Why? Well, that king who blinded me, Kolatanga, please give him liberation. That was his compassion. Bhartaraj said, granted. Anything else? No. And he left. And then Rama, he came back, and Ramanuja see, could see he was, you know, he didn't ask. He said, You didn't ask, Bharaj. Why? 
And because uh, he felt, why should I ask anything for myself? He was completely selfless. So then Ramanujacharya thought of a way. He said, go to Bhartaraj and tell him that you've lost something that belongs to your spiritual master and you want it back. <laughs> so he went, sat in front of Bhartaraj and was praying. And then after a while, Bhartaraj spoke. Again, you're here? Yes, something? Yes, I've lost something that belongs to Guru Maharaj. What is that? My eyes? Okay. And then he immediately got his eyesight back. The Lord restored his eyesight. That was Koresh. <laughs> the story of Koresh is, an, is, a, is a book in itself. In fact, there's one temple in South India it's called the Koresh Temple that he is the deity there, the main deity, and he is worshipped. He is made, he's was such an amazing, amazing disciple. And there are many, many other stories of Koresh. <laughs> There's one beautiful story. It's short. I'll tell you this one. This was, there was one very rich man, and he had a very, 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 very attractive wife. <laughs> she was beauty personified. <laughs> and he would come to the festivals that were organized by Ramanujacharya. And, but he wouldn't pay attention to the festival. He would just look at his wife. That's all. <laughs> he would just stare at her. He was just looking. He could not not look at her. He was always looking at her, <laughs> constantly. Wherever they were together, he was looking at her. Now, they both were well, quite wealthy. So the devotees were getting a little upset that he comes to the festival and he just looks at his wife. <laughs> so he's not really paying attention to what's going on. So they told Ramanujacharya, so now Ramanujacharya decided to do something. <laughs> so he came in to meet the man. The man was very respectable. And he, re he greeted Ramanujacharya. And then immediately he started to glorify his wife <laughs> and explain how beautiful. And she was. She was an angel in all respects. <laughs> so Bar uh, what Ramanujacharya said, if. I show you eyes that are more beautiful. That was her beauty. She had this, these eyes that were just so beautiful. He said, if I show you eyes more beautiful than that, will you look at those in the same way? He said, I don't think there's anything more beautiful than this. <laughs> you come with me. So he said, all right. So he came. He took him into the deity room, and he brought him in front of the deity of Bhartaraj. Take a look. <laughs> now this man had an appreciation for beauty. <laughs> so that was his good quality. So he's standing in front of Bhartaraj and he's looking and he's looking and he's looking and he's... Re and Bhartaraj must have did something because he, the man was mesmerized. And after some time he said to Ramanujacharya, I found something more beautiful. <laughs> the eyes of the Lord. And after seeing, after experiencing the beauty of Bhartaraj's eyes, completely surrendered, him and his wife both came and became first-class disciples of, Bhartaraj, of, of Ramanujacharya. And there's beautiful stories and how, <clears throat> well, this story is, the details are not so clear with me, but I can remember some of it. They became, they surrendered everything. And now his wife, she was always decorated with so much jewelry. As Prabhupada said, wealthy people are not interested in gold. They think gold is just like yellow stool. 
they love jewelry. So if a person is rich, they have jewelry, you know, like diamonds and various types of, and it's, you're supposed to decorate your wife with all these things. That's part of being a Krishna conscious devotee. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you remember that, right? <laughs> Just in case you forget, don't, you can forget the rest of the lecture, but don't forget that part. <laughs> so there was an economic problem. Now, she was always decorated really nicely. So there was an economic problem that the brahmacharis needed some money for a particular, I can't remember the details. So Ramanujacharya told him, okay, you go to the wife of that man. I can't remember his name right now. Um, I don't think I have it here. And uh, you take the jewelry off his wife. <laughs> She's not going to give it to you if you ask for it. But you're going to have to steal it. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't think he used those words. But anyway. So the brahmacharis came when she was sleeping at night. And so she was laying on one side where half of her face was open, but the jewelry was there. So they came and very carefully and quietly, without waking her up, started to remove her jewelry. <laughs> now, that's a difficult job for brahmacharis. <laughs> now, she could understand what was happening and she was saying, oh, the brahmacharis of Guru Maharaj are here, and they want my jewelry. OK. So while after they took the jewelry off one side, she just turned over to expose the jewelry on the other side, and then they completed the, the job. <laughs> and then they left. So then, of course, later on, she told her husband. And he could understand, yes, actually, you did a wonderful service. <laughs> And so that was how detached they were. Although they were very rich, still, when that situation comes, they didn't you know, t say anything. They just gave the jewelry. The details of that pastime require more, much more explanations to really get into the mood of how that all happened. But that's the essence of this story. The essence of, although they were so wealthy, Still, they weren't at all attached to any of it because they had become disciples of Ramanujacharya. So I'll end, I'll end with one story, and this is very instructive. If you can remember this story, this will be the best part of the lecture. And it's based on a teaching from the Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> Rama, there was one Dasarati, his name was Dasarati. He was the nephew of Ramanujacharya. He was his nephew. The Dasarati came, oh, there's two stories. Well, I'll just have to be able to tell one. I, as I'm telling one story, I'm remembering another one. Um, so Dasarati said, Guru Maharaj, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Sarva Dharma Pradiksa Jamami Kam Saranam Vajam Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Vyomoksi Ismami Ma Suchyaha. Can you, tell, can you explain to me the meaning of that verse? Ramanujacharya said, You go to Shailapurna. Shailapurna will tell you the answer to that verse. Now, to do that, he had to travel a very long way. So he went to Shailapurna and said, Guru Maharaj, I asked him the, the meaning of this verse. He sent me to you. So please explain the meaning of the verse. Shailapurna said, no, you go back and ask Roman Ujacharya. <laughs> so he went back. Ramanu During that time when he was gone, <clears throat> Ramanujacharya had a, a niece, too, 
and she just got married. She was young. And she got married, and her mother-in-law was working her really hard. Her mother-in-law was making her go out, collect wood, and then carry water for all the household chores. And she was very nasty to her. Yeah, why are you so lazy? Collect the wood, cook for your husband. Because that was her son, and she was really heavy. And so this poor girl was suffering. <laughs> trying to serve her husband and, uh, and, not, and not, you know, go against her mother-in-law. So she finally, she broke down and came to Ramanuja Chari. Said, I don't know what to do. I'm trying, you know, she's just so cruel. She makes me work so hard. I'm so tired. I can't do it. <clears throat> Ramanuja Chari said, all right, you go back. I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> so when then, uh, when Dasarati came back, now, Dasarati was a scholar. He knew the Vedas well. I mean, he was one of the most prominent scholars. But he wanted to hear Ramanujacharya's explanation of that verse. So when he came back, Ramanujacharya said, all right, you're coming back for the answer, but I have a service for you. My niece, who's also your, your cousin, she needs help. So you go and you assist her. Help her with her household chores. So he said, okay, Guru Maharaj, if that's your instruction, yes. And then he went, and then he started to help her. And the girl was so happy. Oh, my cousin has come. Dasarati, the great Dasarati. Jai Shisi Panchatattva Ki Nityananda Ram Ki Jai. And so, he started to help her carrying the wood, the water and everything, and everything was going on well. Nobody complained and she was getting relief from all that heavy services. And so, in order to do that, he became a common laborer. Just, you know, he's a scholar, so now he's no longer doing his scholarly studies and work and preaching. He's acting as a menial labor carrying wood and water for his cousin. So one day when he was doing his chore, he saw there was one man and around him was a large circle of people. And he uh, decided to go listen to what was going on. So he's dressed in his work clothes. And the man was speaking on some points from Shastra. And therefore, as he was listening, he could understand this man doesn't know what he's talking about. Because <laughs> Dasarati, he knew the Shastras well. And so, he started making faces and showing his displeasure. And so the, the, the person who was speaking, he could see, oh, and then he turned to him and he said, something wrong with what I'm saying? What's the problem? Do you think you know better? Let me hear. So he explained the same thing that that other person was explaining. And when he explained it, everybody, including that person who was explaining it, was amazed by the explanation. He said, this is amazing. This is a wonderful explanation. Wow, how, you are so knowledgeable. Who are you? My name is Dasarati. You're Dasarati. You're the famous Dasarati. We all know of Dasarati, the scholar. But look at you. You got work clothes on. You're doing menial work. Why? He said, that is the instructions of my spiritual master. He has given me this instruction. Then, when he went back to Ramanujachari, he said, now you understand the meaning of that verse? Dasarati said, yes, now I understand. 
Sarva Dharma Pariksit Jam, Mame Kam Saranam Vajam, Aham Tvam Sarva Parpa. That's the meaning. So Ramanujacharya taught him the meaning through this, this, this example that the instructions of the spiritual master are actually the meaning of that verse. Not what, even though he was so qualified, he gave him a job like a menial servant just to t show him that this is the actual principle. Whatever the spiritual master orders, that is the principle of success in bhakti. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful point to understand as we may have so many abilities and whatever, and usually the spiritual master will guide us according to what abilities we have so we can make advancement. But sometimes we're given instructions that may seem to be different or contrary. If we understand that as the principle of, of pleasing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, because by pleasing the spiritual master, that's our connection with Krishna. So that's a, if we can remember that principle, we have no problem in devotional service. <laughs> so, yeah. So I heard that story from Ravnath Swami Maharaj. <laughs> so, yeah, he tells that story very nicely. So these are some of the things that, oh, there's a beautiful story. Oh, I wish I could remember the details. Because one of the principles that Yamamunachari told him is to write a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. And in order to do that, he needed one particular book that was at one Vishnu temple that was being guarded by the Brahmanas. And nobody could get that sh book. Nobody could get, nobody was allowed to have that book. Nobody could, would, could, could read it. It was kept in the temple in the Didi area. Uh, but somehow when Ramanujacharya, the, the details were, so somehow or other, Ramanujacharya, along with Koresh, Koresh was also there. They, the, that night the Didi arranged for them to get the book. I can't remember how that happened. And when they got the book, they left. Because if it was found out by the brahmanas and the others that they had the book, they were going to take it back. So they left. And then the next day when the book was missing, those brahmanas, and some of them were mayavadis also, they chased after them and found them and got the book back. But Koresh had read the whole book before that and memorized the whole thing. And therefore, Ramanujacharya wrote down whatever Koresh would memorize. So he had the book. <laughs> so that's a wonderful story. How he got that, that was one of the instructions of his spiritual master, to write a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Because only when you have a commentary on Vedanta Sutra is your, your uh, uh, sampradaya authorized? You're not authorized unless you have a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Then there's another story that's in relationship to our sampradaya when we were challenged by the Ramanandis. I think I told that story. Yeah, yeah. Because our commentary on Vedanta Sutra is. That's the one that was written, but what is our commentary? Srimad Bhagavatam. Yeah, Amalam Puranam. That's the, that's the commentary. Govinda Bhasya was done because they wouldn't accept, you know, Srimad Bhagavatam as the authorized commentary for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Yeah. So, okay, these are some few of the stories that. So we could listen to Ramanujacharya's, I mean, his, his pastimes are just like unbelievable. If you go to the Sri Rangam temple, they have the body of Ramanujacharya there in the temple, his actual body. They have made resin, they put resin all around it, and it's there. He's sitting in his posture holding his 
sepulcher, he used to have this stick he would hold. And when you take darshan of that, and it is very, very much Ramanujachari. <laughs> you can feel his presence. You can see. You can almost see him there in within that form, because they didn't burn his body because he was a you know a great such a great soul. So they put it in resin and established it in the temple. It's still there today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the great Ramanujacharya. So out of all the sampradayas, we're very much, our sampradaya is very much connected with the Sri Sampradaya. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm? Which the, what, what book was it? Uh, it was kept a secret because they didn't want this knowledge to be circulated. The name of the book, I don't remember. I have to go back and listen to Radhana Swami's recordings. <laughs> <laughs> huh? He needed that in order to write the commentary on Vadatu Sutra. Without that book, he couldn't write that commentary. And he traveled a long distance to get there. And there's a whole, you know, pastime involved when they got there and finally how the deity arranged for them to get the book. That's a whole other part of the pastime. Yeah. And there's a because the end is another beautiful story of Ramanujacharya, where Shaila, Shaila's Purna. Um, yeah, he came to Ramanujacharya. There was one devotee. I can't name. I can't remember his name. Oh. And he said to Ramanujacharya, "What?" Is the what is the quality of a Vaishnava? You want to know what is the quality of a Vaishnava? So Ramanujacharya said, "You go to Shailapurna. Shailapurna. You go to Shailapurna. He will tell you." Now Shailapurna was living a distance away. He had a particular temple he was managing. And he was just like a lone ranger, just working himself to serve the deity there. So finally he came all the way to Shailapurna, and he said, Guru Maharaj has sent me with this question that I asked him. He wants to, you, you to give me the answer. What is the quality? He said, what is the question? What is the quality of a Vaishnava? He said, uh, I'll tell you in due course of time. You stay here. <laughs> so he stayed here, started to do service there. And he just kept serving the temple along with all the, the devotees there. And it was just, he stayed there for a long time. So after about six months, you know, he never answered the question. <laughs> so after six months, he called them, he said. And then during that time, there was a big festival. And during that festival, this devotee was asked to serve the devotees all the prasadam. So he served very nicely without complaining, and he was enthusiastic. And then finally, you know, Shaila Purna said to him, you have a question you asked me? What was that question again? <laughs> and then he said, yes. So when he served the Vaishnavas, then Shailapurna inspired, was inspired to ask the, answer the question. See, that was the key that brought him back to that. So then he said, well, what is the quality of a Vaishnava? He said, well, a Vaishnava is like a crane. He's like a male hen. He's like salt. And he's like you. That was the answer. He's like a crane. He's like a male hen, rooster. He's like salt, and he's like you. 
but he couldn't figure out the answer. And that's all. He told him that, and he, le and he left. <laughs> then he said, and he was thinking, okay. So then he left and went back to Ramanujacharya. And, and then Ramanujacharya said, did he answer your question? <laughs> After, you know, about six, seven months later. He said, well, yes, Guru Maharaj, but I can't understand his answer. Well, what did he say? He said, well, the quality of a Vaishnava is that he's like a crane. You know what a crane is, a special bird with the big beak. And he's like, he's like a male hen. He's like salt. And he's like me. So Ramanujacharya Midi understood the answer. He said, yes. Can you explain? Yes. Crane. Crane, he stands by the, he stays by the river. And he doesn't, you know, when and, and when the big fish when the fishes go by, he doesn't look for the small ones. He grabs the big fish. <laughs> and when the river river gets flooded, he leaves that area and goes to another place. So when a crane is showing that he takes the best part of something and not just the anything. And when there's too many materialistic people going around, the area gets flooded, he goes to another place, the crane. The male hen, he's looking for food for his children. So he goes into the dark garbage area and he pecks through the garbage and he sees the seeds and the little pieces of fruit that or vegetable in there, and he takes that. So a male hound, he can take the best out of the worst. So that Vaishnav sees the good in everything and goes for that and rejects the garbage. He sees the good in everyone without seeing. Salt, when you, when you, when you make a preparation to give a taste, you put salt. And salt makes the preparation tasty, or not. If there's no salt, it's, it doesn't have much of a taste. But who says, oh, this salt is so nice? Nobody praises the salt. <laughs> they praise the cook, they praise the preparation, but the salt makes the difference. That's a Vaishnav. A Vaishnav doesn't want to be known for what they do. They stay in the background, but they make the difference. Mm -hmm. Salt. Mm -hmm. And you, well, when you were asked to serve, you served all the devotees so nicely. So a devotee is asked to serve, he immediately wants to serve. Mm -hmm. So that was, the, that was the answer given by, you know, Shaila Purna. Now that's good. So devotees are like salt. But sometimes we get too salty. <laughs> but that's another thing. <laughs> but the point is very really well taken that a devotee doesn't want credit for what they do. That's the point. They're happy just to serve and give the credit to the spiritual master, give the credit to the Lord, give the credit to others. So this is... Uh, so studying the life of Ramanujacharya and his devotees, you learn so much from in the in the area of Vaishnav behavior, Vaishnav etiquette, because they are ideal in that area. And they and that's that's their sampradaya. It's just yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think I may have went through the main main stories like that. I can remember one small little story which really has. There was one, one scholar. He challenged anybody to ask him any question on anything, and he could give the answer. And everyone would ask him so many questions, and he would always give the answer. No one could find any fault. So one day, and he was proud. He was proud of his knowledge. So one day, one little boy. He picked up a handful of sand and he said, how many grains are in this head? <laughs> and he couldn't answer. He was defeated. 
when Ramanujacharya found out, he was so happy. You defeated him. <laughs> When you're arrogant, you make mistakes. <laughs> when you're humble, generally, everything works. Even if you make a mistake, nobody sees it. <laughs> Not even you. <laughs> you see it, but you don't. So that's the difference. OK, so this is a little bit about the life of Ramanujacharya. There is, we have written one book within our Society on the Life of Ramanujacharya, really a nice read. And then Srila Prabhupada also speaks many times about him. So we welcome any comments or questions, if there are any. If not, thank you very much. <laughs> Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Shri Ramanujacharya ki jai.